Hello again. Welcome back to Sociological Theory. And today we're going to talk about some theorists who are concerned with, as this slide says, the late modern person and the situation. In the traditional period, you had an idea of the self as what was called undifferentiated. The self is someone who is very much a part of their collective, of their uh, communal life. In the modern era, which you might recall starts like eh, 1750-ish, you know, in very vague uh, terms you could say around that time, the self is seen as changed. Uh, it's seen as rational and emotional, um, but also connected to work, family, and identity. By contemporary time, what some people call the late modern era or the postmodern era, we start to see a new sense of self emerging again. And this self is seen as multiple, uh, some people would say fragmented, schizophrenic. Um, this is influenced by the media. And so what is the self? And that's what these theorists are concerned with, these three that we'll talk about in this set of slides. In the case of Irving Goffman, he's very much concerned with the late modern person as you see or as develops from situations. Goffman was from Canada and he received his PhD from the University of Chicago. He did a dissertation on a Scottish island that became one of his most famous books that I have a copy of here, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. This is an older copy but has been used in classrooms, especially introduction to sociology classrooms around the United States for decades. In 1958 he became a professor at the University of California at Berkeley and then in 1968 he moved over to Pennsylvania and he died uh, early uh, in his life in uh, 1982 at the age of 60. I am going to differ a little bit from the way that Kenneth Allen goes through some of Goffman. I'm going to focus on some of his work in particular um, book by book and how it developed. So this first book that he wrote, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, that I just showed, is rooted in this notion uh, of what's called dramaturgy, something Goffman himself developed. And it's a way of trying to understand social life. It's using theater to analyze social life. So the use of things like stage metaphors to discuss the construction of the self. In other words, if you think about how you play out your day-to-day -day life, you can have, for example, back regions where you prepare for your role. For example, if you were preparing for your role as a student at UNK in a classroom, you would probably be asked to do some reading ahead of time or to complete an assignment to do some type of preparation work. That's the back region where you prepare for your role. The front region would be where you enact your role. In my case, I have to read and study and write up these slides and think about them. And then I perform my role for the webcam here and for you now uh, to show you a little bit more about what this information is about, how it might apply to your life, some contemporary examples. So back regions and front regions you can think of as the way we prepare for our performance in terms of staging our perceived the roles we have in life. Uh, using props, like for example uh, having the books <laughs> that I'm talking with you about. They show that you're prepared if you go into a business situation, you might use a valise or a satchel, a leather bag, to show that you're a professional person. Uh, men dress in suits and ties, uh, for example, for interviews. The setting itself. Uh, what is the setting in which a role is enacted? If I am going to a classroom, that's one setting where I perform the role of a professor. If I go to a conference, 
that might be a different kind of setting with different norms and expectations. And that relates to this notion of the definition of the situation. How are situations defined for us in some ways before we even enter into them? How is your behavior uh, set differently for when you're entering into a library versus entering into a stadium? What are the norms, rules, expectations, and how do they pre-construct what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior and how you should think about a situation? So in this work, Goffman looks at things like how is the self sustained in problematic situations? And he has some lovely examples uh, about how the self is sustained. Let's see if I can find one for you here. There's one in particular that I'm looking for. Here it is. Uh, it's concerning the idea of teaching. Here's a teacher explaining his or her role. Quote, you can't ever let them get the upper hand or you're through. So I start out tough. The first day I get a new class in, I let them know who's boss. You've got to start off tough, then you can ease up as you go along. If you start out easy going, then try to look tough, they'll just look at you and laugh. So how is the self sustained in a problematic situation? If you were going to be seen as a teacher or a knower, you want to establish that role with some strength right from the beginning, at least according to Goffman, or people won't believe you in that role. Uh, how do you create a believable uh, persona for a particular situation? And how is the self produced or maintained in performance? In this instance, you have someone who is presenting themselves as a teacher, as someone who knows something, and so this is a person who would be well served by memorizing facts, being eloquent in delivering them, uh, being prepared, and seeming like they are intelligent, versed, communicative. So these kinds of things relate to the idea that there might not be a single self, but that the self can vary depending on situations, and that to some extent in our modern or late modern world, our sense of self is very contingent upon situations. And that's a fascinating idea, because previous ideas of self would be seen as, as I said before, undifferentiated, a unified self, a consistent self across situations. People believe, though, today that perhaps the self is different and malleable, changing, depending on the context in which that self is presented. Goffman's concerns about the self and theorizing about the self extends into role-playing. And roles are behaviors associated with a particular status. So if my status is a professor, my roles might include teaching, uh, doing research, uh, doing uh, community-based service activities, and the idea here uh, is that that is only one component of the complete me, the complete person that I am. In the late modern era, we shift from situation to situation where our sense of self and our role are very different. And it raises a weird question. Is there a central you? Is there a unified curtain, for example? Or is it just Kurt coming out in this situation is the real person at that moment? Is it completely situationally dependent? So if we're talking about the presentation of self and role playing, uh, you have to say, to what extent do we perhaps wear masks? And that's what Goffman thought. And we project particular identities. As an example of this, in some of my classes, I ask people to think about the role, or I'm sorry, think about a status that they want to occupy in the future, perhaps related to your degree, uh, or maybe you want to be a parent. And you think about the role itself, and what parts of the role are going to be nice and easy for you, 
what parts are going to be difficult. Uh, for example, in my job, I enjoy conveying information and uh, trying to communicate. Uh, grading sometimes is harder because then I have to, well, I'm frankly, sometimes disappoint people. And that's a judgment call that I have to make and I'm responsible for. So how is it that my personality in some ways is altered through my having to enact a role over and over again? What we end up doing is different presentations of self for different people. Sometimes we embody a particular social position and minimize certain aspects of ourself in that context. Um, there's a question about, well, uh, if you, for example, had a great time last weekend. Imagine you had yourself a really great time last weekend. Would you tell your minister about that great time in the same way, or at all, as you would your best friend? So the, the question is, is that we, are we a central unified self, or do we make different presentations of self for different people? And are those lies? Is it lying? Some people would say, hmm, yeah, maybe. But other people might say, well, you're just emphasizing a different part of the self. And that's the idea that Goffman says. The only evidence we really have of a self is interacting with other people. And that is, a, I think, a fascinating set of ideas to play with. So there are other questions that Goffman raises about the construction of the self. One of them is the impressions that you give versus the ones that you give off. We all get in situations where we want to put our best foot forward, and yet, at times, you blow it, or you do things that you don't mean to do, and that may reveal things about you that you wished were not revealed. So there are intentions, intentional things that you present, versus anomalies, problems with your performance, or you could say slips. Um, I had a good friend who went to an interview uh, for a professor position, and he was presenting himself and trying to be very professorial, and in the middle of his interview, he had a shirt on that was a little tight, and one of his buttons flew off. And so then he had to kind of make a joke about that, you know, the impressions you give versus those you give off. Which one is real? Goffman said, and this is smart, that even in situations where we're presented with substantial anomalies in someone's behavior, we tend to play along, meaning that if, for example, your professor seems to not be with it on a particular day, can't remember facts, or isn't particularly prepared, um, we come up with these excuses or kinds of, you could say, accounts for why this person might not be having the best day. Uh, it's not that they are not a good professor usually. We'll give people many chances to play the role and meet our expectations for what they should be doing. Uh, if your doctor doesn't bring your file in, you often won't think to yourself, well, this person is not a doctor or is a completely incompetent doctor. It will be, oh, this person's overworked or happened to forget this thing. So we tend to give people a lot of grace in these situations. Ultracasting is a very useful term these days because the notion is, is that there are some contexts where you can force someone to take on a particular identity. One example might be if you encounter a police officer today, the police officer pulls you over and asks for identification. You really don't have any choice in that context as to the role that you're going to take on. You can't say, well, I'm, an em I'm uh, late for work right now, and I'm an employee, so I need to go and just drive away. That police officer has used altercasting to force you into a role you are a subject of scrutiny by law enforcement. You have to interact in that particular context. Um, in this context, you are in the role of a student. and There isn't a whole lot of choice, you could say. So how do some roles, uh, how are some roles forced upon people 
And that's something that you also see these days in, in everyday life, especially with bureaucracies. When we have social interaction, there's also practice we probably have talked about at some point. Impression management, managing the impressions that you give off to others. You reveal some things, you conceal other things. People want to make a favorable impression. And so if you're in an interview, for example, someone asks you that lovely interview question, what are the worst traits or what's the single worst trait you bring to this position? You know it's a total setup, right? They're trying to get you to reveal that you have these problems. And it's also a good interview question because you are supposed to be prepared for an interview by saying to yourself, okay, if they ask me that question, here's the right response. You say something to the effect of, well, I'm uh, very, very conscientious. And sometimes it's maybe over the top. Or you say, well, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So what you've done is you've kind of made a strength into a weakness, or you've presented a weakness as actually a real strength. And so you haven't given them anything really bad about yourself. And that means that you have worked the question well, if you will. I've seen, for example, videos where people didn't answer the question in a way that showed good impression management. Some people, I've watched interviews where someone was asked, what's the worst trait you bring to a job? The person said, well, you know, my last job I was a cashier and you know, I, I fell short of the rent one month so I took a little money out of the till. But I put it back at the end of the month. And I'm sure that person likely didn't get that job. But we all do this. This is an essential character of human beings. And it's something that Goffman revealed as an important component of our shared social life. Asylums is the next work that I'll talk about with you and Goffman. And here's another copy of a book by him, that uh, one version of Asylums. It's been said that Goffman's wife was mentally unstable and that he spent time observing mental institutions. And that was part of how he fell into this topic. In that book, he talks about total institutions. His term for places where people carry out almost all of their activities. So some examples might be mental hospitals. Once you're in a mental hospital, you're in there 24-7, as they say. Uh, once you join the military, especially something like boot camp, you're in it all the time. Uh, you spend a significant part of your uh, life in that particular institution and you don't have access to others. Prison is another example. In those total institutions, Goffman found re-socialization occurring and those often occurring through degradation ceremonies. So the go-to examples of this I think of, if you're um, joining the military and you go to boot camp, you lose key aspects of the self. You lose, for example, your name to some extent. You're just referred to as private. You lose control of your hairstyle. You lose control over when you eat, when you sleep, and what you're supposed to do in contexts that aren't of your choosing. So this is perhaps, as I said, a form of degradation ceremonies, getting your hair sheared, um, being assigned a number if you're in prison, for example. Goffman argued that these are forms of re-socialization so as to make yourself match up with the needs of that institution. There is not a supportive environment for the previous sense of self. The idea is you're being re-socialized to meet the needs of that institution. In the military, the idea is you follow orders and there's a significant strong chain of command. It's not about creative thinking, it's about doing what you're told and the institution creates that type of person because that's what the institution needs. So the institution is directed toward changing the self.
Goffman documents the self's resistance to this process. So how is it that, for example, people aren't fully changed by the total institutions they're part of? In what ways do, for example, inmates work together to reaffirm their sense of self before becoming a prisoner or becoming someone in a mental asylum? Um, how is it that prisons usually facilitate black markets where you're breaking the rules but getting things that you need or want? So Goffman here is talking about how the self can be created against something. It can be involving parts that are hidden, resistant to the institution. Another thing that researchers are interested in with total institutions the, today is that, for example, uh, how do people who have long been in prison, how are they able to or unable to re-enter re civil society uh, after their time is up? Because if you've been in a prison and your self has been re-socialized, is it a self that will work after you're out of that institution? Or is that self going to have problems? These are questions researchers are interested in today because many, many people are in our prisons uh, more than any other industrialized country, and they're going to get out. Another thing Goffman discussed is called the betrayal funnel. And if you think of a funnel, you think of how things move down to a central point. Goffman said that pre-patients in mental asylums go through this betrayal funnel. What happens is that a family member sees some indicators perhaps of mental problems with their um, other person in their life, maybe their wife or husband or son or daughter, and they begin to place pressure on that person that they ought to see a psychiatrist. The person would go and they're going in what's called good faith. They say, okay, say I should see a doctor, I'll go see a doctor. However, what Goffman said is often the significant other and the psychiatrist have colluded. They've already talked to each other. And that means basically that the person who the patient trusted most in the world, the significant other, the father, the son, the husband, the daughter, whoever it might be, the person the patient trusted in the world, maybe the most, has been talking to a stranger about that person's problems. And that violates that trust. So in mental illness, one form of mental illness would be paranoia, for example. And that would mean that perhaps the person comes to feel like, wow, perhaps I really ought to be scared that everyone's against me. Obviously, my spouse or partner is against me. Um, they've betrayed me. There's an old quote by Richard Nixon that epitomizes this situation perfectly. He would say, uh, you're not paranoid if they really are all against you. And so this is the idea of the betrayal funnel. The third book of Goffman that I'll discuss is Stigma. Here's a picture of the cover of this one. And it's a very short book. It's only, gosh, 145 odd pages. In it, he wanted to look at how this social identity works. And he says it's a social identity where the individual is set apart and disqualified or discredited from full social acceptance and participation. So there's something about the person that's seen as different or undesirable uh, and should disqualify or discredit that person from participating in the situation. Goffman discusses three different types of stigma. And the first one is physical abomination, like an abomination of the body. So examples of this might be scars, disfigurement, 
some type of um, physical abnormality. And he starts off the book with a great example of this. He draws from a novel by Nathaniel West. This, once I read this, I had to read the entire book. It was such a evocative story. Again, this is a fictional work that he's referring to, but it makes a great point. Dear Miss Lonely Hearts, this is someone writing to an advice columnist. I am 16 years old now and I don't know what to do and would appreciate it if you would tell me what to do. When I was a little girl it was not so bad because I got used to kids on the block making fun of me, but now I would like to have boyfriends like other girls and go out on Saturday nights, but no boy will take me because I was born without a nose. It's a very shocking end to the sentence. Although I am a good dancer and I have a nice shape and my father buys me pretty clothes, I sit and look at myself all day and cry. I have a big hole in the middle of my face that scares people, even myself. What did I do to deserve such a terrible bad fate? I asked Papa, he says he doesn't know, but in another life maybe I was being punished for his sins. I don't believe that because he's a very nice man. Ought I commit suicide? So how do people, how does their sense of self relate to this process of being discredited? Uh, people who have physical abominations have to present themselves in particular ways to navigate social situations. There are forms of stigma, though, that are not visible. And Goffman says sometimes these are blemishes of individual character. So, for example, you can't see a liar based on their physical appearance. If someone does drugs, there might not be any obvious physical manifestation of that. So this is another form of stigma, though. Being an alcoholic, for example, is a stigmatized identity. The third type of stigmatized identity for Goffman is tribal stigma. So people who are stigmatized based upon their race, religion, ethnicity, or some other type of characteristic. My go-to example for this is in Nazi Germany, Jewish people were stigmatized in a tribal way. They were blamed for everything from the failure of the economy to decline in morals uh, to having lost World War I for Germany. Goffman focuses a lot on the information that the stigmatized person conveys about him or herself in contrast, I'm sorry, in contact with what are called normals, people who are not stigmatized. And he says that they attempt to protect themselves and project themselves uh, in a way that they believe they have uh, and on how a normal would respond to that. Now what does that mean? If you think about how people who are hearing impaired, for example, um, consider a good hearing aid to, to be, what do people who are hearing impaired, what color hearing aid do they usually choose? How about a prosthetic? What color would um, a prosthetic hand be, typically? Probably the same color as the skin that the person has. Flesh tone hearing aids or invisible hearing aids, very hard to see. People don't want to draw attention to something that's a stigma. And this is something that Goffman noted in the 1960s as what he called the good adjustment line. This is a fantastic idea. He's talking about whether or not the disabled person, a stigmatized person, is well adjusted. And the idea of being well adjusted is defined by normals. It means that the unfairness and pain of having to carry a stigma will never be presented to normals. In other words, normals don't have to encounter the stigma. Stigmatized people will hide it from them. They don't want the normal to feel uncomfortable. So it means that normals will not have to admit to themselves how limited their tactfulness and tolerance really is.
He's saying basically that stigmatized people have to act like they don't have a stigma, hide it from people, or diminish its importance through jokes or other things that make the normals feel comfortable in order to be seen as well-adjusted. Some of this has changed with the disabilities rights movement these days, where people will, for example, wear the blades, for example, that uh, are used for running for people who are missing legs. Some people might actually use fa uh, fashion-styled hearing aids, which are colored. But in Goffman's time, he was really focusing on the management of impressions by those with stigma. I also want to mention, too, the quote that I just read, that where it says page 121, that's from the book Stigma, not from your Kenneth Allen book. So if you look through that, you'll find it in the original. The final work I can talk with you about by Irving Goffman is Frame Analysis, and this was written uh, just before he passed away, or I should say published before he passed away. Uh, Kenneth Allen, in his discussion of Goffman, he says that at this point, Goffman changes his analogy. You might recall dramaturgy as the idea of studying social life as being like theater. So he's moving from the stage to the idea of considering social life, life through photography. Um, so, for example, if you look at a frame of a picture, you're focusing on some things and you're excluding other things. Okay. Analogies give you different ideas about how to think about a topic. And so this idea of frame analysis gives him a different kind of emphasis than did his work on dramaturgy. Primary frames are seen by people who use them as not requiring uh, any kind of interpretation, really. They're already organized. And so, as an example, you might think of mm, uh, someone who goes into a church. There isn't a lot of thought necessarily about how you would need to act in that context. It's already been framed for you as to what the behavioral expectations are. Um, the church setting for most people is designed to inspire awe and reverence, and the frame allows us to see certain things and constrain behavior, um, promote certain norms, etc. Goffman also talks about keying, and this is a reference to music. It's an analogy. Uh, so different songs require you to play in different keys. If you don't, you're discordant. You're not in tune with that song. So he talks about five different general types of social situations. You can have make-believe situations, and in that context, you're playing and pretending, perhaps. Um, and this means that people who are aware that other people are pretending, they act in line with that frame, and they are not supposed to be taking the situation seriously or literally. Uh, if you think about a contest, that's a very different set of assumptions as to how a person should function. Um, in a contest, you wouldn't suddenly have someone, maybe, for example, play a practical joke on someone else, because in that context, they might risk losing the game, right? They're very different frames. Ceremonies are different, again. If you think about, for example, um, how things go in church, again, very different from a football game, um, and again, different from make-believe. Uh, technical redoings that is an interesting one because these days we have people who are um, enacting situations based on like a worst case scenario. So the example I like to think of is uh, pilots who are trained to think through how they would act in a situation that could be disastrous. So a few years ago a fellow named Scully had to land his airplane in the Hudson River in New York City. Um, he could have ended up killing 
hundreds of people on board the plane if he didn't execute this task. So in this situation, it brings up a lot of panic and fear. And the way that airline pilots are trained to deal with it is they go into a series of steps that they need to accomplish. So turn off your emotion and go through the procedure. And that you could think of as a, a great example of a, a technical redoing, right? A way that people are trained to think in a potentially very scary situation. Regroupings is fun. I think in the Kenneth Allen text he talks about how someone who's in the upper class might have to work at their church bake sale and so they end up in a situation where they have to be a cashier, right? It's a strange situation for them and it's it's hard so he talks about that. The key idea then at the end of this chapter is that in our modern era, the late modern era you could say, we have multi-contextual games, frames, and all kinds of different situations that require us to be, if you will, different selves and different people. Very different from the previous self, which was really, really contingent on the group. It wasn't even necessarily really separate, separable from the clan, from that particular uh, collective. Harold Garfinkel is the second theorist we can look at in this chapter, and Garfinkel's fun. Garfinkel didn't take the normal route to academe. Uh, he's from New Jersey and was discouraged from attending the university. He hitchhiked from the university, or I'm sorry, to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and um, was able to finish his master's degree before being drafted into the army where he served and then finally was completing a PhD under Talcott Parsons, a theorist who we talked about earlier as the uh, person into grand theories and very systematic based theories. Garfinkel's very opposite to Parsons which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, in 1954 he was able to join the faculty at UCLA and was there for three decades. Garfinkel developed ethno-methodology. Ethno means people or folk. Methodology means practices, or ways of doing things. So a way of understanding this folk methods, the way that people make sense of, organize, and constitute the situations they find themselves in. And he came up with something I'll talk about with you a minute, breaching experiments as a way of understanding the implicit rules in many situations, rules we take completely for granted. We'll talk about them in a sec. He took business classes at one point, and one of them was about accounting and he came up with the idea of accountable that we render situations accountable where we produce social order and reality and that means for example I'll, I'll give you one I have up there uh, a wedding we know about what a wedding is and how to act in a wedding based on this idea of an account uh, if you told someone well I wore a tuxedo the other day, someone might say, well, you know, why? And you would say, well, I went to a wedding. And they would say, oh, all right, they would understand. You've given an account for your behavior in a particular context. It makes perfect sense of your behavior. Uh, I had a friend who wanted to get married, best friend from childhood, and he wanted me to be the best man at his wedding. I introduced him to his would-be bride. They were a funky kind of couple, and they wanted to get married on Halloween, and they wanted to get married in costume. And so what happened was there was a huge clash between this couple friend of mine and the family of the bride. I'll tell you how this played out. The family of the bride said, this isn't a wedding. It's not a wedding. It's not a traditional ceremony. So. The running joke in this is that my friends, the real bride and groom, came to the wedding dressed in costume. They had two friends who came to the wedding 
dressed as a traditional bride and groom, so that was their costume. And the real bride's parents were there. They came dressed formally, and they said, we want to take a picture of you two with the bride and groom that are in costume, because we want you to see later what you should dress like for a wedding. I mean, it was a very nasty comment, but it really showed this idea of an account and how that situation was to be understood. The family of the bride said, this is not a wedding, right? So how do we produce social order in reality, the assumptions behind it? Goffman says we need to use, or I'm sorry, Garfinkel says we need to use the documentary method and it's an approach that reveals the correspondence between an event and some type of meaningful structure. So the documentary method in this case might emphasize the fact that some people considered it a wedding and others did not because it didn't follow formal rules that most people think of related to a traditional marriage, a wedding event, I should say. Garfinkel is different from Durkheim. You might recall Durkheim from earlier slides. Durkheim thought that there are these social facts that are concrete and empirical, real things. Durkheim said social facts are external and coercive. So they exist outside of us and they force us to act in certain ways. A stop sign exists outside of us and if you don't obey the stop sign, you have to face the consequences of it. So Durkheim says social facts are external and coercive. Garfinkel differs. He says that social facts are ongoingly accomplished, that we make social facts and reproduce them every day. We are engaged in concerted activities in daily life to reproduce our social world. Um, my friends were very much violating the social norms of a wedding, but maybe the wedding they felt was for them and they wanted their own wedding to find their way. So we can either remake those facts, as, as Durkheim would say, or we don't. Two other terms, reflexivity and indexical expressions. I'll talk about more. But reflexivity basically is something that you can turn back on itself. So uh, reflexive thinking means you're thinking about your thinking. Indexical expressions, verbal utterances that point to and are understood within the situation. Uh, that means that, really, and we'll get into this in a second, uh, language can only really refer to itself. Words are defined by other words, and I'll talk about it with you in a minute. Most people believe that language is representative. And what that means is, is that people think our words map directly onto reality. So if I say book, I'm referring to this, and that the word book maps onto something real in the world. However, people don't think to themselves about how language is a what's called a closed system. Language can only refer to other words. And so the way that you can think of this is language is indexical and reflexive. Language really only refers to itself. And therefore, you're never getting to a direct relationship with the outside world through language. Language is its own universe, if you will. And that's something that is a, a major insight that these theorists are seeing to some extent here uh, that, again, makes humans kind of unique. We abstract out and put our ideas upon the world, but that doesn't mean that we capture capital R reality. If I were to ask you, for example, how, or no, what you did today. You might tell me certain things that you say are real. Maybe you woke up, you took a shower, uh, you ate breakfast. 
you could say, well, that's real. Okay. But another way you could express yourself is to say, well, I woke up and I thought about how much sleep I got the night before, or I realized that my dream was about an event that happened to me the previous day. And then I began feeling itchy. And that would be real too. You're not getting to the bottom of truth with language. You're describing things, and it can be in a fairly direct way, a poetic way, but that's the idea is that language is not directly connected with capital R reality. And that corresponds with the discussion of Me and and Wood by Kenneth Allen. We in the world have to operate using incorrigible assumptions, assumptions that cannot be questioned, and secondary elaborations of belief. Here's an example. An incorrigible, incorrigible assumption would be if I have this pencil and the pencil is no longer in my office, I might say to myself, huh, I guess I misplaced the pencil. The incorrigible assumption in that context is that this is a physical object that cannot change its form and cannot move of its own volition. So if I can't find my pencil, then my explanation, my secondary elaboration of that belief is, I must have misplaced it. It is not that the pencil suddenly disappeared and reappeared somewhere else. Another culture, their incorrigible assumptions might be rooted in magic, and so they might have a secondary explanation which might say that very thing. So we have certain ideas about reality that we then reinforce through our explanations. And we never even think about the incorrigible assumptions. So a way to get at some of this for Garfinkel was doing what are called breaching experiments. And there are many examples of these. They're a lot of fun to think about. If you want to, you can Google this, uh, find it on YouTube. Sometimes people have gotten on elevators and stood with their back facing the door. And you might find some videos on YouTube where people will see this and they'll think, oh, I don't know what that means or what to do. And occasionally people will also stand with their back toward the door. There's this implicit assumption that you should stand perhaps in a particular way in an elevator. And so what the breaching experiment does is it breaches the rules in order to make clear what those rules are. By violating the rules, they suddenly are manifest. Another great example, if you're bored, you can go to a big box store uh, that has shopping carts. Uh, go to that store and while you're walking around with your cart, take something out of someone else's cart and put it in your cart. Suddenly there are all kinds of things that become very clear. One of them is there's this assumption that this person has their cart and they might even get angry. Uh, a lot of the breaching experiments that Garfinkel did or asked his students to do would cause people to get really incensed. People would say, why did you take that out of my cart? Well, in point of fact, it is not your cart. It's Walmart's cart or Target's cart, right? So through this experiment, Garfinkel allows the recognition of implicit rules. People would say, why did you take that out of my cart? You could say, well, it was easier for me than to go looking for it in the store. Um, suddenly there are all kinds of things that come to light. So these were brilliant ideas, I think, for showing how such experiments reveal unspoken rules and those things that underlie particular social situations and interactions. And along those lines, in our sociability, Garfinkel found that we really should not push for additional explanations. And 
Examples of this might be if somebody says to you today, how's it going? And you say, well, what do you mean by going? And they say, well, how are things? And you say, what do you mean things? If you continually ask for more linguistic clarification of meanings, you start to show people that there really isn't anything underlying the words. And people start to get upset with you if you do this for too long. You're supposed to just wait for clarification, not interrogate people. If you wait for clarification, that is what's considered a normal conversation. If you push too much to try to understand what's happening through having them over and over again explain themselves, then you are punished. People will not talk to you. The final theorist for this set of slides, R.S. Paranbanayagam. He is uh, of Indian descent. And again, Kenneth Allen made choices about who to include in this book about sociological theory. And this is a, a choice of someone who I, frankly, had not heard of beforehand. And so I think he is a very inclusive thinker in terms of what counts as sociological theory and who should be considered a sociological theorist. And this is a little bit uh, different, but it's also a very political act. Uh, it also brings to mind the idea of framing, Goffman's idea, you know, who gets counted as within the frame and who's excluded. So this is a political act, as I just said, for Kenneth Allen to broaden the frame of sociological theorists. The beginning of that part of the text talks a little bit about the Enlightenment and some ideas that you might recall. We really value science, reason, and rationality uh, for uh, Enlightenment uh, as, uh, as Enlightenment ideals. And scientists in this period were basically wanting to say that language can map directly onto capital R reality, that language expresses reality. And the belief then was that even in the social sciences, we could come to some fundamental agreement about how, for example, poverty should be defined, that we can objectively know what this thing is, as opposed to subjectively understanding the world. As we just saw with language, though, language is a closed system. Words only really can refer to other words. So that means that we have the linguistic turn today, which is a huge critique of whether or not you know, Enlightenment science ideals rooted in mapping language directly onto reality can really work. Is it possible or is it a fool's endeavor? Language for Parinbanayagam is inherently reflexive. And there's a joke I'll tell you about in a minute. But the idea is that language refers to more language. But you'll never really get at the truth of words. Even though we say this is a book, um, that idea of what counts as a book might vary from person to person is socially constructed. And the idea of there being words that map directly onto reality just doesn't work. Um, the questions raised by the linguistic term include, how is it that our language, the words we use, how is it that our language affects how we understand the world? Because we selectively define some things and leave other things undefined, unnamed. As one example, uh, I've heard that in China you can have over 50 different terms that are commonly used for rice. In the United States, most people from the U.S. would find that amazing. We don't think about rice in maybe more than five ways. You've got like brown rice, white rice, uh, wild rice, minute rice, um, maybe organic rice. But we don't have that many ways of categorizing rice. So we literally can't taste and understand nuances and differences that Chinese people can. 
the seeing of the fine differences allows them to understand reality differently. And so that's why you can never have language mapping directly onto reality. Language, to some extent, expresses and gives us the way we constitute reality. A great example of this when we talk about how words create worlds. If you think about the old term for what today might be called a differently abled person, the old term might be crippled. Uh, and some people later might say disabled. Um, each of those terms gives you a very different idea of perhaps what some people might see as the same physical condition. And that means that the, the frame of language lets you see some things, but maybe not others. Someone who's crippled can't do something. In Goffman's terms, is highly stigmatized. But someone who is differently abled, the emphasis is on if they don't smell, for example, they may hear better. They may see with more acumen. So the way we talk and think about terms reflects power and a, a unique understanding of the world. There are some terms here. The interactional other. This is the person who's immediately present in an interaction and provides some situational control through some immediate feedback. Then there's the significant other. Uh, this is the idea of somebody who's caring for you the most. Okay, So there's an interactional other in a specific situation, a significant other who's an emotional sort of anchor, if you will, for an act, and also the generalized other. And of course, we talked about a little of this with George Herbert Mead. Attitudes and perspectives, clusters of these that provide an individual with standards of community. And Paranbanayagam argues that the self cannot exist from what are called uh, dialogical acts. Uh, in every act, we put our self into play. So, if you think about the film Castaway, which had Tom Hanks talking famously to, uh, I think it was a volleyball that he would draw faces on. Um, the idea here is, is that we are creating our sense of who we are always through some type of interaction. And these processes uh, discussed by Kenneth Allen here, um, the reflexive process, it says here, is the idea of every act of the self is reflexive. It involves an internalized conversation. So that's a little bit like the I-me dialogue me talked about. The addressive process. Ways of addressing someone like Mr. or Mrs., President, Buddy, George. That is part of our constituting of the self as well. And finally, the answerability process says here, once addressed, cells may be answered or unanswered. When we put a particular self into play, we risk not being answered as such. And there's an example of homeless people. Homeless people are constantly being put in, putting themselves in a sense of self into play that's unanswered. To be homeless in America is to be confronted with gnawing doubts about self-worth. So it's this notion that the Principal reason for conversation enable this is a quote from Paranyam Banam Yagam quote conversation enables the individual to objectify himself or herself as well as enables others to objectify himself or herself. So these together allow us to create some type of self concept and through these acts. The last notion, artful ethics. Here it is. It's, we have many different ways of formulating and presenting a self, and 
we are artists in how we make ourselves. We intentionally use form and shape and discipline and connecting methods and ways to performances. So some words that Kenan Allen said, quote, uh, we have the freedom to paint the canvas of life and reality any way we choose. Yet that absolute freedom of agency is tempered by the demands of dialogue and sensibility. Our art must make sense to those who view it. Your life is a work of art, but you have to create it so that the art is appreciated by others, if you will. The way in which we do that becomes our style, our individualized self. No two people are exactly alike, and so the artful ethics are the way that we create our sense of self in everyday conversations in our particularized, unique manner.